Okay, you do. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will discuss uh, one of the hottest topics. Well, now it is not one of the hottest topics, uh, but it was indeed two, three years ago. The problem of cryptocurrencies. I guess most of you uh, have heard about this phenomenon. It is indeed a very interesting attempt to uh, change, to uh, disrupt actually the global financial system. This attempt was not very successful, but at least a technological solution which we were proposed uh, thanks to cryptocurrencies uh, are indeed very interesting and may have a very good future. But the, uh, but the cryptocurrencies of, uh, themselves, okay, for the time being, uh, failed um, as in an attempt to replace, to modify, to disrupt the global financial system. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start. What do we know about traditional currencies? Let's forget for the time being about uh, cryptocurrencies. Let's discuss the problem of traditional currencies. Well, guys, traditional currencies are for most part centralized currencies and official currencies. Do you understand what it means? A centralized currency and an official currency. Yeah. Could you please explain a little bit how you understand it? Well, it means that the state has a monopoly to produce and to control the currency, um, for example, by the central bank. But mm -hmm. I can say that uh, this process was not like infinite. And before the 20th century, there was also the situation when there were uh, decentralized currencies in many for countries. Example. For example? Uh, for example, in the United States, as I mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. It was a decentralized system and in many European countries uh, as well. Well, actually, if you go uh, deep in the history, you're absolutely right. Uh, many countries used uh, decentralized currencies, you're absolutely right. But technically, in most cases, uh, traditional currencies, currencies which uh, are operational, let's say, uh, from the, how should I say, from the um, 19th century or even earlier, in most cases, these currencies are centralized currencies. What does it mean? Uh, it means that there is an official, uh, okay, actually it means that there is a central agent which is responsible for emission of this currency. In most cases, it is uh, a central bank, a state or quasi-state institution, uh, even in some, well, technically central banks are independent from the government, but obviously they uh, maintain close links with the uh, official authorities. Well, a central bank which issues currency. So there is, there is a central agent, a centralized institution, which is responsible for the monetary circulation. Ladies and gentlemen, we should understand that even when a currency is used in different, uh, in different states, in different countries, it is still a centralized currency. What does it mean? For example, all of us uh, know the situation, uh, the situation with the euro. Euro, an official currency which is used by many uh, countries in the Eurozone. Well, uh, this currency is used by several states. But still, there is a central bank, a European Central Bank, which is responsible for the monetary circulation of this money, of this currency, of Euro, in this Eurozone. Guys, do you understand it? Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Yes. Well, what, what else? Official currency. Official currency means that the currency is recognized by the state as a legal tender. So this currency has to be, uh, okay, it, is, uh, it, it must be accepted as a legal tender, as a mean of payment by, by all uh, economic agents in the country, and which is even more important by all state, uh, state institutions in the country. So the currency can be used, for example, as a mean to pay taxes, as a mean to pay salaries to, uh, to public officers, etc. So the currency is official. Ladies and, and gentlemen, it is critical to understand that a centralized currency does not necessarily mean it is an official currency. For example, uh, a private institution may well issue, uh, may well issue a, uh, a currency. It is absolutely possible. But well, this currency will be used by this institution only and by its partner, obviously, but it will not be considered as an official currency. So some examples are very well known in the history. So the centralized currency, the centralized currency and official currency, uh, 
uh, okay, these features are typical for the modern currency, for the currency we are used to uh, use actually in our everyday financial life. This currency is backed by the state and it is recognized by the state. So the Russian ruble, the US dollar, the British pound, uh, the European euro, etc. All of them are centralized currencies and official currencies. Well, what should we add? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I guess you have heard about it, but let's repeat it in order for us to understand the functions of money. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, nobody knows what is money. Nobody can provide us with a clear definition of money. <coughs> Technically, money is defined on the basis of functions it performs. And well, there are three key functions of money. The first function is pricing. So money is used to set prices. Obviously, as we know, in Russia all prices are set in rubles. In Latvia, all prices are set in the local currency. If I'm not mistaken, I don't, I don't remember actually whether they have introduced uh, euro or not. Well, uh, in, uh, the UK, in the UK, they use British pounds, etc. So, we set prices of all goods, of all services, of all items which can be sold on the market in, uh, in currency, in official currency, most obviously. Well, uh, money, it is also, uh, money is also used as a mean of circulation. Guys, do you understand what it means? Mean of circulation. What is the difference between pricing and mean of circulation? Uh, mean of circulation, so it's uh, like the tool for exchange, something like that. Absolutely right, but you know, you define a thing by a different thing. So, <laughs> yeah. you define circulation by exchange, which is pretty similar, actually. So, uh, money can be also described as a mean of exchange. Could you please specify what you mean? Most probably you are right, but I want to get a, more cl a clearer point of your idea. Uh, so, um, hmm. I'll describe. Uh, uh, so, mm -hmm. pricing is the quality of money. It's the opportunity of uh, measuring uh, different goods. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, com comparing them too. And uh, the mean of circulation is the quality of money. Uh, uh, so um, you can um, you can sell something and mm -hmm. get money and you can uh, buy something on on that sum so absolutely, absolutely mm -hmm. right absolutely right i will develop your idea a little bit further ladies and gentlemen what about pricing well look uh you don't remember these beautiful times uh, the 90s i mean but actually actually uh during this period of time and i guess until uh 2000 uh, too probably, uh, the situation on the market was very, very specific. What it means? If you go to a shop, especially to a shop which uh, sells uh, foreign goods, expensive goods, uh, you would notice a very interesting case. Prices uh, in such shops were set up not in rubles, uh, but in the so-called, I will say it in Russian, in the so-called условные uh, единицы conditional units. What does it mean? This unit was equal to the US dollar, obviously. Due to the high level of inflation, it was uh, not practical to fix prices in rubles because prices would go up constantly. The prices, especially for imported goods, were fixed in uh, the so-called, as I have already said, conditional units, special units. Well, it means that you set your prices in a fixed unit of uh, pricing in US dollars, uh, in masked, in hidden US dollars, as, as I would say. And in this case, you are able to maintain stable prices. Well, but according to the Russian legislation, no payments in US dollars or uh, euros are, uh, are allowed in Russia. You cannot officially pay in foreign currency. Okay, if you exchange money between friends, okay, you can pay in any currency you prefer because it is, a, so to say, a dark deal. But if you pay officially to a shop, in this case, you may use only Russian rubles. So, the prices were set 
in US dollars because okay products were imported in US dollars but you had to pay in Russian rubles the price were converted into Russian rubles according to the existing rate of exchange and well in this case you simply pay in US uh, sorry in Russian rubles uh, ladies and gentlemen what it means uh, what it means uh, uh, I would like to highlight that in this case in this case we have two, di two different features of money. We can use money to set prices, but we do not we do not have uh, to use money to pay. Because, for example, okay, uh, if you know that uh, a unit costs uh, one hundred US dollars and a different item costs also one US dollars, okay, in this case you can simply exchange these units against each other without using money. Well, but uh, money is used to set prices. In case of minimum circulation, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, uh, using money as a mean of circulation means that we don't exchange products directly against each other. We use money as an, an intermediary. We exchange a product against money, and after that, we, we change money against a product we are interested in. So money is an intermediary for our financial deals for our trade operations. Guys, do you understand? Yes. Okay, so we ha I had a comment. I had a comment that money is a social construct. It is absolutely correct remark because money indeed is a social construct. Uh, it is used by the society for uh, the social purposes, by the social economic purposes, I mean. And well, uh, money is crucial to support uh, financial operations, trade operations in the society. And ladies and gentlemen, the third function of money is stock of value. Guys, do you understand what it means? Stock of value. Not really. Maybe uh, we know this term in Russian, but we not know it in English. Well, I'm afraid in Russian it, would, it wouldn't help you because it is a literary translation into Russian. Okay. okay, so could you explain, please? I will try. Ladies and gentlemen, what it means? Mm, well, uh, sometimes we spend money immediately as we get it, as you understand it. So we get our small salary and we immediately go to Petrovka, I don't know, to Petrovka, to Lento or somewhere else, and we buy a lot of products, uh, a lot of products just to eat, just to, I don't know, to uh, wash our clothes, etc. But well, sometimes we may need uh, money for our future expenses. Let's say we save money to buy a flat or better to buy a fridge, I don't know, to buy something expensive, which is not, uh, which cannot be bought on the basis of one uh, salary. Well, in this case, in this case, we have, we have to save money, as I have already said, and you have to be sure that this money will be available in the future. So, uh, money we save now will be uh, exchanged uh, into products in the future. It means that money acts as a stock of value, just a kind of savings for us. So, we save money, we save the value which is, uh, which is uh, stocked in this uh, money in order to be able to spend it in the future. Guys, do you understand it? So, we can... Um, uh somehow uh, keep it absolutely right absolutely right okay we don't, we save it to... save <laughs> absolutely right we don't have it uh, we don't have to spend it right now we can save it we can stock uh, our our banknotes we can pa pile our banknotes for our future expenses okay guys do you understand yes uh, i believe in russian it's a uh, средство накопления или что-то типа того a kind of absolutely like absolute right, absolutely right. Stock of value, okay, it can be translated as uh, as a средство накопления. You're absolutely right. So uh, it means it means, uh, but as I already said, it is kind of a literary translation. So uh, in this case, excuse me, can, sorry. Uh, is, excuse me, is this about investing money for the future? Not exactly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you understand the difference between saving money and investing money? A very interesting question, Sofia. Thank you very much. Do you understand the difference between them? Yes. Can you please explain, Nikolai? Uh, uh, so, uh, when we say uh, saving money, uh, we're talking about um, uh, keeping some part of our um, 
income. Of, of our income and uh, put it uh, somewhere. I know uh, under under the bed here. Mm, and, for example, why not? And uh, when we are investing, uh, we are not just saving. Uh, we are um, taking some part of our income and put it somewhere uh, where this income will work and get bigger. That's right. In case of saving, you just separate a part of your money and you just uh, you just keep it. Uh, you cannot multiply this money. You cannot increase this money. You just put a part of our income as your savings. In case of investment, the situation is different. In this case, you use uh, you use your money to try to generate additional income for you. For example, you open a bank account and you get an interest rate. You invest some money, I don't know, into a business project, into a venture project, etc. In order to get more money than you invested. In case of savings, you always have the same amount of money. In case of investment, you hope you will get more than you put uh, into this investment project. Guys, do you understand? Yeah, yes. but in terms of saving, you actually lose some kind of money. You do Could not have keep your problem value. right. Please specify. Well, basically, we have inflation rate. Absolutely uh, right. Excellent. And mm -hmm. uh, due to this thing, uh, the money that just lies down without being used in the economy, mm -hmm. it loses its value by about 5% each year. So it means that we are actually losing money if we are not investing in, into some kind of bank loans. But this bank loan will only generate not more than uh, the inflation rate. So you're just keeping the same value. Well, look, uh, what is the diff uh, what is the point? You are absolutely correct. You get, uh, you, okay, you provided us with a brilliant explanation. Thank you very much, Sofia. I will specify that a little bit. Uh, look, in case, in case of savings, you just preserve the nominal value of money, as I understand it. So if you have 1,000 US rubles, you always have the same amount of money as a saving. But well, obviously due to the inflation, despite you, you keep the same amount of money in nominal value, obviously you lose your purchasing power. Guys, do you understand what means purchasing power? Uh, yes, it's, uh, mm, it's the amount. Mm, okay, it's the amount of goods uh, which we can buy uh, on our um, budget. Absolutely right. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you understand, as you understand, money by itself is intri intrinsically useless. You cannot use money uh, to satisfy your needs, as you understand. You cannot eat money, you cannot use money to go make clothes, you cannot use money, I don't know, uh, to build up a flat, etc. Uh, money is uh, useful only as a mean of circulation. It is useful uh, only thanks to its ability to be exchanged into, our, into other goods uh, or products. Well, uh, so uh, the key feature of money which is important for you is uh, its purchasing power. As you know, due to the inflation, the, uh, the purchasing power of money is constantly decreasing. Uh, I remember the time, it was pretty long time ago, guys, it was 22 years ago, uh, but well, um, at this period of time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the price of shawarma in St. Petersburg was uh, 6.5 rubles. You can imagine the, the difference. So now the, the price of shawarma is about, if I'm not mistaken, 150 rubles. So you can imagine the, the increase of prices. Ladies and gentlemen, we should understand. We should understand that uh, savings does not mean does not mean you try to preserve your purchasing power. Uh, it means that you try to preserve uh, your nominal value. Technically, technically, we hope. Uh, okay, technically, uh, we hope that the inflation is not so high, and your value will not be destroyed. But obviously, uh, if we analyze our future financial decisions, obviously we, we have to take inflation into account. But formally, formally, even a part of our value is destroyed by inflation, it will happen without any doubt. Uh, even a part of our value is destroyed by inflation, the most part of our value will be, will be preserved. So we hope that money can be used as a stock of value. 
Well, uh, in most cases, just to preserve our purchasing power, just to preserve it without increasing it, we have to invest our money. Uh, okay, so saving is not enough. And in order to increase our purchasing power, okay, we have to invest really hard in order to get a decent uh, rate of profit. But ladies and gentlemen, it is a very uh, technical situation. I just want you to understand that money, despite the inflation, is able to preserve value, at least partially, for most part. Do you understand it, guys? Yes. Okay. Okay. In, in case of normal monetary situation, obviously, in case of huge uh, uh, inflation, in case of hyperinflation, if you, if you have heard about this phenomenon, okay, obviously, your, uh, your value will be destroyed very fast. Uh, have you ever heard about the hyperinflation in Germany in the 20s? Have you heard yes, about thanks to remark. Okay, excellent. You you know the classics, great. Ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to highlight uh, after the after the first uh, world war, the economy of Germany was literally destroyed due to uh, due to very harsh peace conditions, and well, uh, the hyperinflation was unbelievably high in Germany during this period of time, and salary to workers was paid twice a day, twice a day. Because prices went up so fast that if you pay uh, your salary, uh, if you if you get your salary once a day, you will not be able to exchange it uh, into uh, goods at a decent uh, at decent prices. You had to go to shops twice a day in order to be able to exchange your salary into goods. So, guys, in this case, obviously, money loses its function of uh, stock of value. It still uh, acts as a mean of circulation and, the, and as a mean of pricing, but no stock of value, obviously. But technically, in a normal situation, money should be considered as a stock of value. Guys, do you understand it? Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Okay, excellent. Sorry, just a moment. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now as you understand, the digitization of money occurs. What does it mean? Technically, technically, we still have a normal cash in circulation. We have, uh, for example, in Russia, we have a lot of uh, ruble banknotes which are in circulation. We have a lot of coins which are still in circulation. But we are constantly going uh, towards a cashless economy. What does it mean? Cash transactions are, steadily, uh, are being steadily replaced by cashless transactions. Uh, most of you are used to pay by smartphones, by Google Pay, by Samsung Pay, by credit cards, by debt cards, etc. So uh, you don't use cash, as I understand it, uh, not very often. At least, at least what I can, what I saw at the canteen at Kantimirovskaya, uh, well, most students pay by smartphones without without using any cash. So, uh, despite the fact that there still uh, that there still is normal uh, money, we are going to the cashless economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem with that sometimes it is not very useful to uh, live without cash. And one of these reasons is that uh, without cash, without cash, uh, we get an, ex an extensive control over transactions. Ladies and gentlemen, when we pay uh, by credit card, well, actually, when we pay electronically, digitally, it means that our transaction is processed by a bank or by an agent, uh, which has the full information about our financial operations. Well, this information can be used to manipulate us, as you understand, in order to propose uh, advertising, in order to, to target us as, a, as customers, etc. But uh, this information can also be used to uh, control us from the legal and from the financial point of view. For example, to check, uh, to check up if you pay all taxes, etc. Well, uh, even we are absolutely legal, if we fully, even if we fully comply with the law, this control is not very comfortable for us. As you understand, in case of cash, in case of cash, such control does not exist.
Uh, it is technically very difficult to control all units of cash. And well, you pay in cash, in this case, you have almost no control uh, over your transactions. Uh, I guess you have, you have seen a lot of movies where uh, a mafia prefers to pay in cash. That's exactly the point. Uh, they prefer a cash just because no full control of cash uh, over cash is possible. Guys, do you understand it, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, yes, and uh, yes. maybe it's uh, the main reason uh, why uh, governments um, are <laughs> supporting uh, this uh, cashless economy. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, the government supports uh, the shift towards cashless economy uh, just because, in this case, the state can have a full control over the financial transactions of its uh, citizens and, uh, and of its economic agents. So if you pay uh, in uh, electronic money, if you pay via official payment tools like bank accounts, etc., in this case, all uh, your um, financial transactions can be traced back. And well, in this case, you cannot avoid uh, taxation. In this case, you will have uh, to provide the state with the full information about the sources of your income, etc., etc. So uh, the cashless economy is a very good, uh, is a very good basis for the state control over your financial situation, which is not very comfortable for all of us guys. Again, uh, even if I'm fully legal, uh, I prefer to uh, preserve my financial privacy because in some cases, okay, I do not uh, inform uh, anybody about what I am paying for and why I am paying for it. So guys, uh, digitization of money, okay, it is a source of, of comfort for us because as you understand in this case, we, uh, we don't have to, uh, to have a lot of cash. Uh, we can be more secure because, okay, uh, if someone steals uh, our current card, okay, he or she will not be able to pay by it. But still, but still, from the point of privacy, from the point of view of privacy, it is not very comfortable for us. So here we arrive to the cryptocurrencies. Ladies and gentlemen, cryptocurrencies represent an attempt to introduce a kind of digital cash. Uh, a, a kind of digital cash which would combine uh, the comfort of digital payments with the comfort of real cash, with the anonymity of payments, which is pretty good for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, what cryptocurrencies are? First of all, they are an alternative currency. What does it mean? They represent an alternative to official centralized currencies. They do not, uh, okay, they don't have any uh, support from the state. They are private currencies created by uh, private uh, communities or private uh, companies. Uh, and they present an uh, alternative to official, official state-backed currencies. Cryptocurrencies are digital currencies. So they exist in digital form only. There is no cash cryptocurrency. Ladies and gentlemen, probably you have heard about scams which were organized here in Russia, where uh, scammers uh, proposed uh, cash bitcoins to people. Well, in, uh, in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Moscow Metro uh, tokens were used uh, as an imitation of such uh, Bitcoin cash. But well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was obviously a scam, which was based on uh, financial illiteracy of uh, victims. Uh, technically, no, uh, no uh, material cash uh, in case of cryptocurrency exists. And well, cryptocurrency is a decentralized currency. What does it mean? Uh, what does it mean, ladies and gentlemen? It is a very, very important point. Probably it is the, the crucial point for understanding uh, the nature of cryptocurrencies. Uh, cryptocurrencies uh, are not backed by a central agency. They are not backed uh, by a central institution. They are decentralized. Uh, 
So, uh, there is no central authority which is responsible for the issuance of this uh, cryptocurrency, for the destruction of this crypto, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, for the uh, circulation of this cryptocurrency, etc. Uh, cryptocurrency is based on the community efforts. It is decentralized. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand it? Yes, uh, but could a government uh, run an official cryptocurrency? Well, a very good question. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think about it? Can a government introduce an official cryptocurrency? Uh, no, I guess it's impossible. Why? Could it be the Since explain? it will be centralized currency already. Absolutely right. Uh, it will be controlled uh, by the government, but the pure reason for the cryptocurrencies is to have less control over some specific state. Well, uh, Sophie, you're absolutely right. I will develop your idea a little bit uh, further. Ladies and gentlemen, technically, a state can introduce a cryptocurrency, but not a decentralized currency, because, okay, uh, there is no reason for, the, for a state to use decentralized uh, means of payment. A cryptocurrency are based on encryption, as you understand, on cryptography. So a state may introduce a kind of a digital currency, which is protected by encryption, no problem. Uh, but there is no reason for the state to introduce a decentralized cryptocurrency. So a genuine cryptocurrency is not a state business, so to say. But still, a state can introduce a cryptography-based digital currency. Uh, it is exactly what China is doing now. They are introducing a digital yuan, uh, probably you have heard about it. Uh, it is not a cryptocurrency, obviously, but it is an encrypted digital currency. Guys, do you understand? Yes. Okay, so le let's continue. Ladies and gentlemen, in case of such a digital uh, decentralized currency, we have a very important problem of double spending. What is it, what it means, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I will explain. In case of our normal cash uh, money, uh, can we spend one unit of money twice? For example, okay, then uh, we have 1,000 euros or uh, rubles. I mean, we have one banknote uh, with the nominal value of 1,000 uh, rubles. Well, can we use this banknote to pay at Lenta and immediately to go to Petrushka and use the same banknote to pay at Petrushka? Can we do so? No, if we are not uh, tr trickers. <laughs> Okay, obviously, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we, uh, okay, uh, obviously, double spending is always uh, a scam, is a trick, you're absolutely right. But still, is, is there a technical possibility to do so? Obviously not. If you spend one banknote in Lenta, okay, uh, this uh, banknote no, uh, does not belong to us anymore, so we cannot use it twice for payments. And even if we, uh, even if we use electronic payments, Okay, we cannot spend the same amount of money twice, because, okay, all our payments are controlled by our bank. If we pay uh, 1,000 rubles uh, at uh, Lenta, okay, we cannot use the same amount of money to pay uh, at Petrushka a little bit later. Because our financial transaction is controlled by the bank, uh, the bank knows how, money, how much money we spend, and okay, the bank will, uh, will not simply authorize us to use the same amount of money twice. But technically, but technically, in case of decentralized, uh, of decentralized monetary system, the problem of double spending is possible. You see a beautiful picture on the slide, I hope you see it. Uh, well, what it means actually, ladies and, and gentlemen, what is a digital currency? What is a cryptocurrency actually? What is a Bitcoin? You see here are the symbol of Bitcoin, which is obviously the most uh, known example of cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin is simply a file, an, uh, a file which registers information about this monetary unit. Ladies and gentlemen, as you understand, technically, it is possible to copy a file, as you understand it, all of you do it uh, when you copy your Word files. Uh, you can copy this file and to send it to two different agents. We see uh, a guy at the left part of this slide uh, who decides to use uh, Bitcoin, uh, to use this very Bitcoin twice. 
Uh, he decides to pay the, to pay uh, these two different persons by the same Bitcoin. Well, it could be possible. It could be possible if we could copy a Bitcoin file without check. But ladies and gentlemen, how we can prevent this problem of double spending in case of the centralized monetary system? Again, in case of a, of a centralized monetary system, this problem is simply elimina eliminated by the fact that the central agent controls our payments. Well, in case of the centralized uh, monetary system, a kind of decentralized control should be implemented to avoid this problem. How it works? Ladies and gentlemen, I would remind you a little bit about blockchain. If you remember, we have already analyzed this system uh, during our previous lectures, but still, let's repeat. What is blockchain? Blockchain, more specifically, is a protocol that allows a distributed control over transfers of assets via internet. Assets, different uh, sources of value, including bin coins, obviously. So, in this case, in this case, we have a distributed control, a control from a distributed community over financial transactions. Ladies and gentlemen, you probably remember that blockchain is based on chains of blocks. Block is a, okay, is a piece of information, so to say, which register uh, data of a transaction. Uh, each block, uh, each block contains information about all previous blocks, and these blocks are connected into a chain. So, uh, this chain of blocks represent a very stable source of information about financial transactions. If you remember, if you remember, these blockchains, uh, these chains of blocks, so to say, these blockchains are saved within a distributed network. What does it mean? Many computers, many nodes have the identical copies of the blockchain. So, even one of these copies is destroyed, uh, other copies will survive, and the integrity of information about financial transaction uh, will be saved. So, uh, so in this case, uh, we preserve information uh, of uh, financial transactions, not within uh, one centralized agent, but with a distributed network. Many nodes preserve the identical copies of blockchains. Ladies and gentlemen, now we go to a very important point, to unilateral functions. Unilateral functions, it is a mathematical function, which is very difficult to be calculated, so it requires a lot of computer, computational capacities, but it is easy to check. What does it mean? You have to invest a lot of computational capacities to perform this calculation. But as soon as the calculation is done, Everybody can easily check if the calculation is correct. What does it mean? Uh, why uh, these unilateral functions are so important? Ladies and gentlemen, again, we have to check information. We have to check information about financial transactions in the absence of a central agent. So all nodes, all nodes of uh, this blockchain Calculate unilateral functions associated to these blocks of transactions. This calculation is a kind of check. If the calculation is done, the transaction is approved and it is included into a block. So calculation of unilateral functions according to an algorithm of this blockchain is a kind of verification of uh, integrity of information. And well, what else, ladies and gentlemen? Blockchain I mean, Bitcoin blockchain is based on pseudonymity. Do you understand what pseudonymity is, guys? Well, is this the anonymity that is not real? Not exactly. Not exactly. If it had been anonymity, I would have used the, this very word, pseudonymity. In that case, not really. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in case of uh, our real cash transactions, okay, in case you pay by uh, material banknotes or material coins, okay, in this case, your financial transaction is fully anonymous, as you understand it. If you go to Shavarma kiosk uh, and if you pay in cash, okay, nobody knows who you, who you are. Uh, 
You simply pay, that's all. Your identity is not checked as it cannot be checked on the basis of banknotes you used for payment. In case of blockchain, in case of uh, digital payments, the situation is pretty, diff is pretty different. Well, even, uh, even given the fact that blockchain tries to preserve anonymity of its users, it is not uh, absolutely possible to do so. As you understand, in order to be used, uh, in, in, in order to be able to use uh, digital payments, okay, uh, you have to you have to um, be registered in the in the system. Uh, you need a registration in order to get access to blockchain platform. But well, contrary to the official financial system, you have not uh, you don't have to disclose your real identity. You can use a pseudonym uh, without any problem. So you can be registered, I don't know, as uh, Ivan Ivanovich Ivanov, if you understand this Russian joke. So nobody will check you. Uh, you can find any, you, okay, you can create any Gmail account in order to exchange uh, emails with the um, platform, etc. So, uh, so you are not absolutely anonymous, obviously but you are pseudonymous your real identity is not is not disclosed but still but still there is a kind of registration for you in order to participate in this blockchain platform guys do you understand it yes uh, uh, so it's uh, something like uh, false an anonymity uh, no? okay it is not a false anonymity actually okay um it is not uh, it is not complete anonymity, but it is not a real uh, identity either. So uh, if I don't know if uh, the United States official financial authorities want uh, to trace you back, obviously they will be able to do so. But technically, technically, if you use VPN accounts uh, and if you use a good pseudonyms, okay, in this case it will be extremely difficult to find out who you are. So it is a kind of uh, it is an okay. It is not a false anonymity, I would say. It is an it is an imitation of anonymity, if you understand what I mean. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, proof of uh, transaction. Okay. So, uh, we have already discussed it. Uh, each transaction is a part of a block. So, all transactions are registered in different blocks. Each block, I have already said it, includes information about all previous blocks. So, uh, it means that if you want to modify a block, uh, you will have to modify all later blocks. It is a kind of protection, it is a kind of uh, information security of blockchain, because in this case you will have to sacrifice a lot of resources in order to be able to modify information in a blockchain. Indeed, if you modify a block, you will have to modify all later blocks, which will require a huge amount of resources and can hardly be feasible. So, uh, what can we say about confirmation of transactions in blockchain? There are, there are actually th uh, two basic parts of this confirmation. First of all, inclusion of transactions into blocks. So how, uh, how transactions are registered and rules of generation of blocks. So how blocks are created. Let's look. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will remind it. It is uh, a slide from our previous lecture. Well, uh, in order to be registered uh, into a blockchain, and it is true for uh, cryptocurrency blockchains, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you that cryptocurrencies are just one of possible implementations of blockchain. Blockchain is a very effective tool of registration of information, not especially about cryptocurrencies. But now we analyze cryptocurrency blockchains. Well, uh, in order to be registered, a transaction must occur, obviously. If there are no transactions, we, have, uh, we don't have any, anything to register. The transaction must be confirmed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you remember, as I have already said, the confirmation of transaction is a calculation of this unilateral function. The transaction must be registered into a block. Okay, so uh, it should be included into a block of information. This block should be given a hash, a registration number, which determines the place of this block in the, in the blockchain, in the chain of blocks. 
And well, after this, the block is added to the chain and is open to view. So after this, this block uh, is publicly available to anybody and anybody can check information in this block and in the whole blockchain, obviously, too. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, so after the confirmation, uh, after the confirmation of the transaction, a block is generated and a block is given a hash, a registration number. There are th uh, four main models of confirmation of transactions by the community. Proof of work. Ladies and gentlemen, it is exactly, um, okay, how should uh, we understand it? Well, uh, in case of uh, blockchain, in case of blockchain uh, used for cryptocurrencies, uh, how it operates? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I have already said, a lot of nodes are checking transactions. But obviously, they are not interested in doing it for free. They should be remunerated for it. They should get a payment for their services for blockchain. And well, the node, which is the first to uh, register a block, to generate a block, gets a compensation, a Bitcoin. It is exactly how mining operates. Have you heard about Bitcoin mining? Yes, of course. Well, it's how, uh, it's how uh, Bitcoin mining operates. And not only Bitcoin mining, many cryptocurrencies are using the same model of mining. Well, as soon as a block is confirmed, the node which confirmed it, which was the first to complete this uh, calculation of any of functions, gets a compensation. Uh, a Bitcoin, a unit of Bitcoin is automatically generated according to the algorithm. And this unit of Bitcoin goes to this very node. So uh, this is why uh, these nodes are called miners. They are very similar to gold miners, actually because they perform very uh, difficult tasks and they are compensated by units of cryptocurrency well uh, how we can uh, use how we can use um, this model of confirmation well first of all uh, it is proof of work ladies and gentlemen uh, in this case uh, okay in most of these cases we have to calculate uh, we have to calculate a very complicated unilateral functions, uh, a very complicated unilateral function, uh, if you remember it. But well, in case of proof of work, you have to use a lot of uh, computational capacities to be able to calculate this uh, function. And the higher is the amount of your computational capacities, the higher is the probability you will get this Bitcoin, you will get this unit of cryptocurrency. So the probability of you uh, being able to get uh, a compensation is directly related to the amount of your computational capacities. In case of proof of space of, proof uh, of computation, sorry, yes? uh, uh, and so compensation is paid only for the first. Um, mm, I know check or absolutely right. It is right. There are, in case of Bitcoin, there are thousands of nodes which are calculating which are calculating uh, these unilateral functions. But only the first one uh, to generate the block is getting the compensation. So, uh, so it is a probabilistic approach. So, if you are the first one to calculate the block right now, it doesn't mean you will be the first one to cal to calculate the second block. So uh, most uh, most nodes uh, do get their compensation, but well, uh, there is no guarantee that your calculation will be successful. It uh, will be uh, recognized as such by the Bitcoin al algorithm. Okay. 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 So proof of space or proof of capacity, it is pretty similar uh, to the previous approach. But in this case, the probability of you getting the compensation depends on uh, the amount of your memory, on the memory you sacrifice for calculations, not your computational capacities, but your memory. Uh, there is a very interesting approach, proof of stake. In this case, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, the probability to get a compensation depends on the amount of cryptocurrency on your account. What does it mean? The higher is the amount of cryptocurrency on your account, the richer you are uh, in terms of cryptocurrency, the higher is the probability that you will get a compensation. So this model uh, incentivizes, um, incentivizes users to invest into cryptocurrency. And well, ladies and gentlemen, the fourth, the fourth approach is very simple. It's the consensus of the community. In this case, in this case, the nodes which are responsible for running the blockchain simply vote, uh, so to say, to recognize if they agree with the, uh, with the transaction or if they disagree with it. Uh, if the consensus is reached, in this case, um, the transaction is approved and is included into the blockchain. Guys, do you understand it? Yes. Okay, so it is a very, uh, very simple approach without any technological, how should I say, intricacies. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what about issuance of cryptocurrencies? Mining and forging. I have already explained the basic model of mining. Forging is pretty similar. I will go uh, a little bit uh, back to the previous slide. Uh, mining is used for proof of work. Uh, forging is used for proof of space or for proof of stake. So technically it is the same procedure, but the uh, model of compensation is different. You use different tools to increase the probability to get your compensation. Uh, uh, sorry, and uh, proof of capacity, what is it? Maybe uh, I, I missed. Uh, in case of proof of capacity, what does it mean? Uh, you have to uh, use a lot of memory in order to support the blockchain. Well, in case of proof of work, you have to use a lot of computational capacities to support the computation and the calculation of these unilateral functions. In case of proof of capacities, you have to, uh, uh, to use, you have to invest a lot of uh, memory to maintain the blockchain, to uh, register this blockchain. So, uh, in all these uh, models, in all these models, you have to use different, you have to sacrifice resources, but the type of resources is different. In case of proof of work, it is computational capacities. Uh, in case of uh, proof of stake, it is, uh, it is cryptocurrency on your account. And in case of proof of capacity, um, okay, in this case, uh, you use uh, memory capacity of your computer. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, here you see this uh, very description on the slide. In case of mining, you use proof of work, so you have uh, to calculate a lot. And okay, you have to use uh, computational capacities. In case of forging, uh, probably have heard about this um, model. In case of Ethereum, uh, probably one, probably the second uh, most popular cryptocurrency. Uh, well, in this case, you use proof of stake, so you have to possess uh, cryptocurrencies on your account. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, what does it mean? Uh, again, in case of computational capacities, you calculate, uh, okay, you use these computational capacities to calculate unilateral functions. Well, you have to uh, possess a very fast computer with a very powerful uh, computational, uh, okay, power of computational capacities. Uh, as you probably have heard, uh, NVIDIA video cards were very popular for uh, Bitcoin money. So you have to possess a very, very powerful computer. Excuse me, well, could you please explain once again how forging works? Well, in, ca in case of forging, what you do? Uh, in case of forging, what you do? Well, in case of forging, you also have to confirm transactions, but the probability for you to get a compensation doesn't depend on your computational capacities. In this case, uh, the probability to get a compensation depends on how much uh, unit of cryptocurrency you have on your account. Ladies and gentlemen, actually, what does it mean? Each blockchain, each cryptocurrency blockchain has to attract nodes, has to attract users which will participate in making this blockchain run, obviously. But okay, different blockchain, uh, different blockchain uses different technical models. In case of uh, Bitcoin, they need a lot of calculation. 
So they attract users and they incentivize users to invest computational capacities into, uh, into this blockchain. So the higher are your computational capacities, the higher is the probability that you will get a compensation in the form of a Bitcoin you mine. In case of Ethereum, uh, if you uh, read information about this cryptocurrency on the internet, the situation is different. They prefer, they prefer to make users invest into this cryptocurrency. Well, how it works? The higher is the amount of cryptocurrency in your account, the higher is the probability that you will get a compensation. So, uh, so uh, the bigger is your account, so to say, uh, the higher the probability that uh, the compensation for your participation in making this blockchain right will get uh, okay, the, will go to you, not to other users of this blockchain. So it's like a progression function where so, you have so it's like progression function when you have little there is a small probability of you getting something absolutely right. but when uh, your account increases the probability absolutely right. Absolutely right. Okay. absolutely right okay so ladies and gentlemen what are the advantages of mining okay obviously it is the low risk of monopoly at later stages ladies and gentlemen what it means as i have already said uh, Bitcoin and all other cryptocurrencies, technically, all of them are distributed cryptocurrencies. But okay, nobody forbids you to get control over this cryptocurrency. Let's imagine you get uh, more than a half of computational capacities used to run this uh, used to run this blockchain. It is absolutely possible. It depends on your resources. Well, uh, thanks to this um, approach, uh, okay, uh, the, mon the risk of, of monopoly is reduced at later stages of blockchain. Obviously, when this blockchain starts, okay, it is easy to get the full control over this blockchain. But when it develops, obviously, uh, it is very difficult to get control over this huge community. So, if we reduce the risk of monopoly, it means that we uh, maintain, maintain this blockchain as a public one, as an open one, as a decentralized one. Well, the disadvantage is obviously high risk of monopoly at earlier stage. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, when Bitcoin was uh, just launched, uh, most deals uh, with blockchain were performed by uh, just one user. So obviously, obviously, at earlier stage, at earlier stages, uh, the risk of monopoly is very high. And ladies and gentlemen, why the risk of monopoly is dangerous in this case? Well, if one user or if a group of users gets a control of a blockchain, it means that this group of users uh, may be able to manipulate this blockchain to extract profits. Uh, to get additional units of uh, cryptocurrency, to cancel transactions, etc., which is obviously not uh, a desirable outcome for other users. Well, what is the second disadvantage? High consumption of energy. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have already said, in order to make Bitcoin run, you have to sacrifice a lot of computational capacities. And obviously, and obviously uh, it requires a lot of uh, electric power. If I'm not mistaken, uh, three years ago, the electric consumption of the whole blockchain system, of the whole Bitcoin system, sorry, uh, was equal to the electric consumption of Slovenia. Uh, Slovenia, as you know, is not the biggest country in the world, but still it is an independent state uh, with its own economy. So the consumption of energy, uh, which was necessary to make Bitcoin run, was equal to the electric consumption of an independent country, which is pretty high. And ladies and gentlemen, a low speed of transaction. It is actually the greatest problem of Bitcoin. <coughs> Sorry. Um, in, order to, uh, in order to verify transactions, as I have already said, you have to calculate these complicated functions. It requires a lot of time. So uh, Bitcoin is not able to uh, process more than um, one. Okay, how many? If I'm not mistaken, more than uh, 10 transactions per second, which is pretty low. Uh, Visa and MasterCard processes thousands of transactions every second. So uh, from this point of view, Bitcoin is not very comfortable for users. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, Excuse me, can you give a comment about Bitcoin? You said that 
Yes. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, there is a high risk uh, of uh, monopoly, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. but then it lowers. But I have heard that nowadays there is a huge monopoly happening around the Bitcoin. Is it true? Well, actually, actually, it is not. Comp okay, look. The problem with that, the problem with that, uh, at the earlier stages, as I already said, it was uh, a real monopoly. So just one user or a very limited uh, number of users had a monopoly over this um, over this blockchain. After this, this monopoly had been destroyed thanks to the inclusion of new nodes of new users, which uh, made this blockchain run and obviously we, uh, which were independent from each other. Now, you are technically right, there is not exactly a monopoly, uh, but okay, there is a huge domination of Chinese users, uh, of Chinese users, uh, who, from, who, how should I say, who, who control the, uh, the main part of nodes which are used to run, uh, to run uh, Bitcoin. Well, technically, technically, it is, uh, it can be, this situation can be described as a monopoly. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this monopoly is not used to extract additional profits, because users understand that if they uh, use uh, this uh, monopoly for unethical profits, so to say, it will destroy trust to blockchain, uh, to this Bitcoin blockchain, and it will destroy their own profits. So, despite the Chinese users, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest Chinese conglomerate controls uh, more than one half of computational capacities, but I'm not sure about it, I, I don't have to check it. Wait, despite this fact, despite this fact, they do not impose their rules. They simply increase their probability to get additional units of Bitcoin. Do you understand it? I understand. The reason I'm asking is that I have been reading about some alternative yeah. coins nowadays and many of them criticize Bitcoin due to this specific reason and state that we're going to be better because we're going to deal with this um, monopoly problem. That's why I was asking. Uh, your question is absolutely correct. Thank you very much for it. Uh, okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what I would like to specify, okay, a monopoly, a monopoly from the economic point of view is an organization which is able to impose its, rule, uh, its rules over the market, as you understand it. So, uh, it is an organization which is strong enough to make other agents, uh, other economic agents, uh, to act according to its rules. Uh, in case of uh, Bitcoin, the situation is a little bit different. Technically, it is indeed a monopoly. So there is, as I have already said, a concentration of computational capacities within one uh, organization or a, within a very limited group of organizations. But these organizations do not impose their rules. They comply with the uh, initial Bitcoin algorithm, because as I already said, if they destroy these rules, they will simply destroy the idea of Bitcoin itself, and they will suffer from, from, from it. Do you understand it? Okay, so in your point, monopoly in cryptocurrencies is not that huge problem as the monopoly in regular currencies. <sighs> Well, technically, technically, it may be a huge problem. It may be a huge problem. It depends on the currency. Actually, Bitcoin it is, is a leader uh, in the field of uh, cryptocurrency, so uh, they have to maintain the reputation of this cryptocurrency, if you understand it. But it, uh, we can design a cryptocurrency uh, with a real monopoly, which will serve purposes of its organizers. And in this case, obviously, it will not be a really decentralized currency. It will be in a, a monopolized currency. Okay? Okay, I understand you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so the problem with that, the problem with that, you are absolutely right. Uh, some currencies, uh, some new projects of cryptocurrencies, boast that they will preserve the idea of complete decentralization uh, and will avoid the problem of uh, ex excessive concentration, which is typical for Bitcoin. Well, probably it can be an advantage, but for the time being, I cannot, uh, I cannot be sure about it. But okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go further. What about types of mining? Uh, we can distinguish three types of mining. Individual, collective, and hidden. Do you have any ideas what it can mean? So, uh, you can mine uh, bitcoins for example, on let's, let's on your it. own, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you can um, 
uh, found a firm to uh, mine Bitcoin. Uh -huh. And you can uh, mine Bitcoin illegally if it's illegal in your country. Uh, no? not, not exactly. Okay, okay. you're very close to, to, to the point. Thank you very much, Nikolai. But I will explain it a little bit further. So in case of individual mining, you're absolutely correct. In this case, you use your own computer or your own farm. Probably you've heard uh, this term, mine farm. A group of computers which are run by an organization in order to uh, mine Bitcoin. Okay, the, as I already said, the higher your uh, computational capacities are, the higher the probability you will get in Bitcoin is. So you may buy uh, 100 to 1,000 computers. It depends on your income, on your financial uh, on your financial uh, well-being so uh, but you do it individually you are an independent bitcoin miner or cryptocurrency miner if you prefer but i will say it bitcoin because it is probably the best example in case of collective money the situation is different okay in this case in this case you understand that you, that you do not have enough money to invest into a huge mine farm you have just one computer okay in this case, you combine your force with other users. You create uh, a so-called collective farm, a kind of cooperative, actually. So, uh, in this case, you combine your, uh, your uh, computational capacities, you group it in 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 computers, and, okay, you get a share in all bitcoins your uh, collective group mines. In case of hidden mining, it is a very interesting case. It means that you don't have enough computational capacities to mine Bitcoin. But still, you do not participate in a collective. Okay, because in this oh, case... Yes? I've got an idea. Uh, okay. So, in case of uh, hidden <laughs> mining, you hack um, computers of other people and uh -huh. Uh -huh. mine uh, Bitcoins... Uh, using them that is right in this case you hack uh, other people computer other people computers smartphones uh, tablets etc so anything which has computational capacities and you form a network uh, of these computers which calculate uh, which okay which is used to mine bitcoins for you in this case you uh, secretly use um, other people computational capacities for your own profit uh, it is not completely illegal, okay, uh, but obviously, uh, but obviously, in this case, you reduce the computational capacities uh, which are available to real owners of these computers. Uh, their computers start working slower, etc. But okay, in this case, in this case, you form a hidden farm, a hidden farm. Uh, you group other people's uh, computational capacities in order to uh, in order to mine bitcoins for yourself, okay. As you probably know, okay, guys, any ideas where this model of uh, hidden mining was very popular? In which country? Or in which countries, if you prefer? I think in those countries when, uh, where there are um, more problems with economic freedom and with the stable economic institutions. For example? Mm, like Russia, I, no, partly. Iran, maybe. <coughs> Or is something like this? Ladies and gentlemen, two countries, if you prefer, uh, Russia and Ukraine. So these countries really used a lot of, uh, a lot of, okay, they really uh, developed this idea of hidden mining. Okay, so let's but go. Isn't this hidden mining illegal, sort of? Because you're using electricity? Could you please repeat? I don't hear you. Uh, is this hidden form of mining illegal? Okay, uh, how should I say? Uh, how should I say? Technically, I don't know. I cannot give you a precise answer because I'm not sure there is a specific legal uh, interdiction to do so. Uh, but obviously, in this case, in this case, you interfere with the privacy of others. You um, hack other people's computers, which is not obviously legal. But as you understand, it is very difficult to trace back this um, these hackers. So I guess I guess it is uh, illegal. It is it is illegal, uh, but it is very difficult to protect interests of users from the legal point of view. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so let's go. Can I add something? Uh, could you please repeat? I didn't hear you, Alexander. Uh, can I add? Of course, go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, there are some uh, uh, kind of legal uh, strategies how to do so, this uh, hidden mining. Um, maybe with uh, uh, installing some uh, programs uh, when you uh, when you give an access to your computer, uh, maybe in uh, some soft uh, uh, can be implemented uh, such uh, tools that will uh, give an access uh, to you to your computer capacities and it's uh, a form of not illegal uh, assess, but uh, I think uh, in uh, most cases it's uh, hacking and uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, a kind of crime. That is right. That is right. And in order to protect you against such uh, hidden mining, you can use different uh, antivirus per software, etc. But well, uh, as you understand, as you understand, in, my, in many cases it is difficult to do so. Again, as I already said, let's imagine a, a Ukrainian hacker hacks computers in Russia uh, via VPNs. Okay, it will require a lot of resources to uh, trace um, him or her back. And in addition, you should understand that your computer is hacked. You get no uh, ads, you get no uh, technical problems, your files are not destroyed. Uh, you, you, simply your computational capacity is used and it is not very easy for you to understand what is the reason of this um, slowdown. So, uh, so uh, in many cases, in many cases, uh, it is very difficult to trace back and to punish such hackers. But well, as I have already said, it is uh, it should be considered as an illegal intervention into your uh, into your electronic space, so to say. Okay, guys, do you understand? Yes. Okay. Now let's go to forging. Uh, I have already explained a little bit what is it. Uh, let's go to the advantages and sh shortcomings of forging. Uh, okay, in this case, we have a low consumption of energy. In this case, you don't have to invest a lot of computational capacities uh, for uh, mining, for forging. Uh, there are also stimuli for investment uh, into cryptocurrencies. So, uh, people get interested in uh, investments into cryptocurrency, which supports, it which supports its development, which supports its exchange rate, which is obviously good. But the problem with that, in this case, in this case, uh, the in, the influence of members with high shares uh, with high shares of uh, cryptocurrency, I mean, increases. So uh, the richer you are, the more influential you are. Okay, guys, it is capitalism, obviously, so it is quite normal. Uh, but um, distributed cryptocurrency are a kind of a challenge to the traditional financial model of capitalism. And well, this high influence of rich people is not probably very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, fork. Have you ever heard about it? Fork? Um, no. Not exactly. Okay, I will try to explain. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, each blockchain is a protocol, so it is a kind of software based on specific rules, on a specific algorithm. This algorithm, as you understand, are not perfect, so they can be improved, they can be modified. Uh, they can be modified by the community of nodes, uh, it can be modified by the co company which launched this uh, blockchain, but still, this protocol can be modified. Uh, in order to make it better. So there are, uh, okay, this modification, this modification of protocol is called fork. Uh, why it is called fork, ladies and gentlemen, you understand, uh, because after this uh, change of protocol, we have two, uh, two protocols, actually, the older one and the new one. Uh, and there is no guarantee that all users will shift, uh, will uh, switch to the new protocol. Uh, some users may prefer to uh, continue using uh, the older protocol. And in this case, on, on the place of one uh, cryptocurrency, we get two cryptocurrencies. Uh, you have probably heard about Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, which are results of such, of such forks. 
So in case of a soft fork, all the new protocols remain compatible. So transactions performed with both protocols are recognized as valid. In case of hard fork, no compatibility between all the new protocols uh, is ensured. In this case, in this case, uh, really two new cryptocurrencies emerge. Uh, an old one continue to exist, and a new <coughs> cryptocurrency based on the new protocol emerges. So uh, it may create some problems for users uh, because they have to choose uh, which protocol to use. But still, but still, forks are uh, a necessary part of the development of um, cryptocurrency software. Altcoins, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a technical explanation. I don't, uh, I'm not sure it will, it will be useful for you, but still, just to give you an idea about it. Altcoins or alternative coins. Cryptocurrencies alternative to Bitcoin, or actually all cryptocurrencies ex, uh, except Bitcoin. Bitcoin, as I have already said, is considered to be a leader uh, on the cryptocurrency market. Uh, well, uh, but still, but still, uh, many other cryptocurrencies exist, and these cryptocurrencies are called altcoins, an alternative to Bitcoin. Uh, you see an explanation uh, just a little bit uh, lower. Uh, Bitcoin dominates the cryptocurrency market. So all other cryptocurrencies are, ju are just considered as no more than an alternative to Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency markets or cryptocurrency exchanges, ladies and gentlemen, what is it? Uh, what we should understand? Actually, we have two different financial worlds, so to say. We have cryptocurrency platforms uh, where we can use um, cryptocurrency for payments, for money transfers, etc. And we have our real world where we have to pay with our traditional money, US dollars, Russian rubles, British pounds, I don't know, Swiss uh, francs, etc. And these two financial worlds are not compatible. You cannot use uh, you cannot use uh, Swiss francs to pay on cryptocurrency platforms, and uh, cryptocurrencies uh, is virtually uh, not acceptable uh, anywhere. Okay, indeed, some countries and some um, entities recognized uh, bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies as a legal tender, uh, but their popularity is not very high. So they are pretty exotic, so to say. Uh, even if some shops uh, accept uh, cryptocurrencies, they use different financial schemes. They use different financial schemes, uh, schemes. Sorry, uh, for this, uh, so it is not a real payment in in bitcoins, so to say. I don't know if you have heard about a very interesting situation here in Russia three years ago. One uh, one uh, home appliances shop announced that they would uh, accept bitcoins but how it operated in the real life <coughs> uh, in this case in this case if you wanted to use bitcoins for payments in this case you call this shop uh, the shop g uh, gave you the uh, bitcoin wallet uh, number of one of its workers you pay in bitcoins to this worker and this worker used uh, Russian rubles to purchase this uh, home appliance, this uh, home product for you. So no real direct payments between the user and the uh, shop occurs. It means that the uh, use of cryptocurrency is very limited in the real life. And well, <coughs> cryptocurrency markets are used to convert uh, cryptocurrencies into uh, traditional money and traditional or fiat money into, electo into uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, the problem is that uh, in most cases, cryptocurrency markets are not based on distributed ledger technology. They do not use blockchain, actually. It makes them uh, less secure than the traditional blockchains of cryptocurrencies. And indeed, they are the less reliable part of the system of circulation of cryptocurrencies. Ladies and gentlemen, all, uh, all successful hackers' attacks against uh, cryptocurrency blockchains, against cryptocurrencies actually, uh, were done against cryptocurrency markets. So, not, cryptocur uh, not cryptocurrency blockchains were hacked. Uh, cryptocurrency markets were hacked. 
Uh, so they are indeed uh, they are indeed the less secure part of the system of circulation of cryptocurrencies. What are the advantages of cryptocurrencies in general? Higher security, indeed. They are very well protected from the um, point of encryption than the traditional money and even than the traditional electronic money. There is no external intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, as you understand, in case of a normal money, uh, the central bank can uh, modify the exchange rate, it can modify uh, the interest rate, etc. In case of cryptocurrency, no such events can occur. Uh, the circulation of cryptocurrencies is based on algorithm. And there is no external control over transactions. As I have already mentioned, in case you pay by a credit card, the information about your payment is immediately av available to your bank and to the bank of the person uh, you pay to. It can be also available to tax officers, etc. In case of cryptocurrencies, no such control takes place, which is very good. It protects our financial privacy. But there are some shortcomings, obviously. Lack of legal regulation. So actually, nobody knows how to use uh, how to use uh, cryptocurrency. Well, in Switzerland they are legal. In Russia they are not. Uh, it means that in Russia you can possess cryptocurrencies. It is not forbidden, but you cannot use them for payments. Well, it greatly reduces the uh, the utility of such um, bitcoins. So, uh, the problem is also that uh, Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies in general are meant to be global. They are a global currency which, is, which can be used for international payments. But there is no international leg legislation which supports uh, the use of cryptocurrencies. Possibility of hackers attacks. Uh, as I've already said, uh, blockchains themselves are very secure, but uh, electronic marketplaces are not. So hackers attacks against, uh, against uh, marketplaces may be successful. Possibility of illegal use, guys, it is pretty obvious. As you understand, uh, the pseudonymity is an excellent feature uh, for uh, illegal use of uh, cryptocurrencies. So if you want to buy drugs, if you want to uh, require a ransom for a hacker attack, etc. In this case, obviously, you will require a payment in Bitcoin, because in this case, your payment will be absolutely anonymous. High volatility. Well, uh, I don't know if you have analyzed the exchange rate of Bitcoin of or other uh, cryptocurrencies, but they demonstrate indeed a very high level of volatility and very high level of instability. The exchange rate goes up, goes down. Uh, it is very unpredictable. So it is not a very good stock of value, actually. So cryptocurrency for the time being, it is not a real money. It, is, it can be better described as an investment tool. You invest in order to get money in the future, not to stock value. And obviously, ladies and gentlemen, ecological problems in case of Bitcoin, in case of uh, proof of work, because you have to use a lot of electric power in order to mine Bitcoins. What are the prospects of development of cryptocurrencies? Well, there are two potential scenarios. A positive scenario and a negative scenario. In case of positive scenario, cryptocurrencies will become a part of the normal financial landscape. So they will, will be used as a normal payment tool for different purposes. But in this case, a strict regulation will apply in order to protect the interests of all users and the interests of, uh, the interests of uh, states, obviously. In case of the negative scenario, cryptocurrencies will survive just uh, uh, as a marginal tool of payment for dark web, illegal transactions, etc. Uh, for the time being, this scenario looks more realistic uh, because uh, bitcoins are mostly used for uh, payments which are not a part, so to say, of the legal payments. Okay, guys, that's all I wanted to discuss with you today. Do you have any questions? Guys? Uh, uh, sorry, I've got a question uh, from the beginning of our lecture um, about uh, when we were discussing mining, yeah? Mm -hmm. Maybe I have missed it, but uh, 
there was a satanic proof of a space uh, what uh, is the difference between proof of, of space method and uh, proof of capability okay I have, also, I have already explained it I will repeat in case of proof of work uh, in case of proof of computational capacities uh, during no, not proof of work, something like proof of space. It was. Uh, mm -hmm. May I finish? Y yes, of course, sorry. <laughs> so, in case of proof of work, uh, you use your computational capacities as, an, uh, as a tool of uh, making b blockchain run. In this case, your computational capacities are used to calculate unilateral functions, and it is used to check transactions. In case of proof of space or proof of capacity, which are synonymous, in this case, you use your computer memory to uh, to support uh, blockchain. So your memory is your computer memory is used, so to say, to stock information about blockchain to stock this information. And in this case, in this case, <coughs> sorry, your compensation will depend on the amount of your memory capacities you dedicate to uh, blockchain. Do you understand? Okay, they are synonyms. I thought that. Uh there were two different ways okay now it's clear <laughs> yeah yeah proof of space and proof of capacity they are mm -hmm. synonymous absolutely okay okay now i understand thank you you're welcome more questions uh, i have a question about models of emission you stated that there are mo mostly two of them like mining and forging uh -huh. but there also exists like cloud mining is this a different uh, model or just the another version of mining it is, also, it is just an, uh, an additional version of mine, that's all. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if uh, that's all, I thank you very much for your participation. Uh, guys, uh, next week we'll have our final meeting. We have two seminars uh, next week, uh, two, uh, okay, um, two seminars. So, I kindly ask you to prepare to, uh, to prepare two topics for the last seminar, and after that we will have our final lecture. Okay, guys. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, guys, uh, uh, sorry, yes. uh, there is a question in the chat. I cannot read it. Could you please uh, read it for me? Will we have a Will we have an exam? No. Oh, no. There will be no official exam. Uh, all your grades will be based on the cumulative basis. Okay, and uh, you have you have mentioned about the topics. Uh, should we prepare what? Okay, uh, next week we will have two seminars. Uh, so uh, for the next uh, for the next week we will have the presentations of the team number seven and of the team number eight. Okay. Okay, I see. More questions. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Thank you very much for participation. See you next week and have a, have a good time. See you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.